Anger. If you watch TV long enough, every night in the news we're seeing anger expressed. Lately we've been seeing a lot of anger expressed in places like Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Ukraine, where people are on the verge of civil war and you see people shooting each other, hurting each other, killing each other. There's a lot of anger in the world. I look around and you don't have to actually shout at somebody to let them have it. You can actually text something and let somebody have it because words can be lethal. Getting home anywhere? Oh, I'm not going to call you. I'm not going to tell you face to face, but man, am I going to get back. Moms and dads have a way of expressing anger to each other. Something must be going on because almost half of our marriages are falling apart. And when moms and dads are really upset with each other, well, it somehow shows up eventually in our children. It's one thing to have a tantrum. Kids do. It's the way it is. It's what growing up is about, yeah. But it's another thing to be continually upset and angry and really mad. And sometimes it's tied to an illness and there's treatment for that. But many times it's not. Many times our kids are afraid and they're mad and they don't know how to express it. If you look around today, we were talking about driving I don't know what's going on on the roads, but people are really ticked. And some very holy people do some very nasty things on the road. When people cut in front of us, when they drive too slow, as Don is saying, and, and or, things happen on the road like no other place. I was going to show you a, a little cartoon with Goofy, but I decided, no, nah, uh, you get the idea. We live this every day on the road. People seem to be angrier than they've ever been. We seem to be saying and doing things, and we seem to have bigger problems or shorter fuses. I don't know what's going on, but people seem to be on edge. When we don't get things our way, when God isn't answering our prayers, we sometimes say and do things that are so unchrist like A recent study shows that one out of five Americans has an anger management problem. One out of five. 30% of the homicides in the United States are caused by arguments in the home. We get all upset and everything and we think that the police are out there and they're in the midst of riots, but they'll tell you, any police officer will tell you the most dangerous place to go is a home where there is domestic violence and people are at each other, they get angry and they lose control. It's dangerous out there. Reckless anger is growing, and it is apparently, it was a problem in the first century as well. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, addresses this in his letter to the Ephesians. As you'll open your bulletins, there's a little handout there to go to this wonderful passage in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. Hear these words of Paul to the Ephesians, to the early church, and to us. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. We'd, we'd go into the whole chapter, but frankly, that passage is so packed, we've got to unpack every word. There is someone here this morning who needs to really live in that passage. In fact, would you just say these words with me this morning? Let's just say them together. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. I think all of us need, <laughs> I think we need to memorize that one. Because over and over again, life is going to hit us. And we are tempted to go over the top with our anger. Yeah, we're all annoyed, but how do we respond? Sometimes it's over the top and it's not of the Lord at all. It's not, what we are, um, um, it's not that we are about to fly off the handle and throw our hymnals at people we don't like. 
<laughs> Sometimes we see people just going crazy. But something may be simmering in your life. Something may be going on inside your heart, and it's taking a toll on your attitude. This morning, God wants to give us the power to conquer anger, to really put it in the right perspective, to use it in the right way, to not run away from it or deny it, but to really know how to deal with anger. We're in a sermon series called More Than Conquerors, and out of that wonderful letter to the Romans, Paul reminds us that we're not just here to get by, but we are here to overcome. He said in his letter to the Romans, in all these things, in trouble, in hardship, in persecution, or in danger, we are more than conquerors through him, Jesus, who loved us. Jesus has enough love, enough power to help us overcome the issues that we face every single day. He has the power to help us overcome. And before God can help us overcome anger, I think it's a good thing to know what is anger. What is it? If you go through the Bible and you'll walk, go through the dictionary, I've come up with a little definition here. Um, anger is a feeling of displeasure, oh mercy, <laughs> resulting from injury, mistreatment, or opposition that shows itself in a desire to fight back. Dr. Tim Murphy, a psychologist, says that anger is usually expressed in five ways, five stages. The first stage of anger is mild irritation. It's that feeling of discomfort, those little annoyances from things that you just don't expect. Somebody says something or does something, and it just kind of rubs you the wrong way. We've all been there, haven't we? You can't live this life without having those annoyances, those drivers driving too slow, or that comment by your spouse, or a child who's, well, driving us nuts. We all have those annoyances, don't we? But then in time, if we're not careful and if we don't go to God, this next stage of anger can come along, indignation. It's that feeling that whatever has happened to me needs to be addressed. I can't just sit here. I've got to let it out. I've got to tell somebody. I've got to do something about it. And if I can't do something about it, then somebody I know had better do something about it. Indignation. It puts our thoughts into action. And then from that stage, we can move on to wrath. If nothing happens, then we really need to take action. Now our emotions are moving into something, a whole new level we yell, we can even slam doors, we bang our fists and we let it out. Everybody knows that we've seen these, these bouts of just expressions of anger. I've got to do something, we'd better do something, I'm ready, I've got to take action here. And if anger isn't dealt with, if we don't take this to the Lord, it's, it's a good chance that it'll move on into fury Fury is, is that time when it's characterized by violence, by a loss of emotional control. Oh my goodness. Fury lashes out in verbal and physical abuse. And if that fury isn't controlled, then it moves on into an even greater expression of anger, and that is rage, where we totally lose control. It's a loss of sanity that causes people to do things they don't even know they're doing. We see this in the news. We see where people have just totally lost it. And I pray that most of us have never seen this up close and personal, but some of us here have. We've grown up with it. And it's changed our understanding of God, ourselves, and what love is all about. What does anger do to us, whether it's the lowest stage or the highest stage of anger? What does it do to us? Well, I'll tell you, it's not good for the body. Doctors say that anger raises the heart rate. It raises our blood pressure and the levels of adrenaline in our system. Do you ever find your heart pounding when you're mad about something? 
and your teeth start to clench and, and you get all upset and anger gets us going. And you know what? If you continue with this, it's not good. We can get actually sick. You, you keep this stuff inside and, oh, it is not good. Here's another good question. Where does anger come from? Is it just about driving? Is it just about the neighbor who annoys me? Is it just about my family? No, there, there are other things going on, I think. What is the source of our anger? Well, sometimes the source is another person. It is another person who rubs us the wrong way. We see them, we hear their voice, and you know what? There's just something inside of us that kind of tightens up. Maybe what really begins our anger thing is not just a person, but a group of people. People who are different than we are. People who disagree with us over our values, over faith, over politics. Oh, my. And sometimes we label these people. Yeah, we label them, and we like to dislike all of them because it protects us, and that way it can keep us at a distance from each other. Sometimes we label them just by the way they look. It can be the color of their skin. It can be something. And we label them, and we don't even know them. And God grieves. Sometimes the source of our anger is a circumstance. It's something beyond our control. It truly has set us off. I'll never forget the, the time when a church down in Southern California decided to take out the last two rows of seats in the sanctuary. The people who liked to sit in the back, oh my, they were very, very upset. Those seats were their seats. They were going to stay in those seats no matter what. And even if Jesus came in the rapture, they would still stay in those seats. <laughs> you and I both know that there are dear folks who need to sit in those back seats. Physical reasons to be close to the foyer is a very important thing. But there are other times when we don't necessarily need to be in the back. And, and maybe just for courtesy, we, we leave those back seats for those who may be new so they don't feel like they're on display when they come, to make it easy for those who are new to come and sit in the back. I'm just tossing this out because seats can become an issue. The color of carpet can become an issue. The sound of our music can become an issue, and I don't know whether God really wants us to be that upset about the music, the color of carpet, or where the seats are, I think what we really need to be upset about is the fact that there are thousands of people all over the Tri-Cities who do not know Jesus. The average age around Richland right now is somewhere hovers around 35, 36 years of age, and a lot of people in that generation are not in any way close to the Lord they're going their way, and they may not be in jail, but they're living without him. And this should really concern us, and we should be angry to the point where our face is on the floor before God, and we are praying for salvation for our neighbors. What grips the heart of God should grip ours as well. We get all upset about this or that. No, no more. What should grip our heart is that which breaks the heart of God, that so many people are living in sin today and they have no idea who Jesus is and they really don't care. Show us, Lord. You want to know, can I just be totally honest here? We're family. If I, as a shepherd, call you to pray with me, at least one lunch, you give up a lunch to pray for God, to renew the soul of our church. I meet here every Thursday at the altar to pray, and if only two or three show up, you want to know what? When it comes time for minister appreciation time, I don't need another gift certificate. I need you to pray. I need to know that God is working in your life. Let me know. Give me a call and tell me, God has blessed me today, or I have a need. Would you join me in prayer? Join me in prayer. 
I don't need more vacation. You know what brings me joy is a saved soul. It's a church that prays that will wail with me before God for the souls of this whole city. This cannot continue. We will never grow and change and be the body God is calling us to be if we're just kind of ambling along. We must pray. I'm angry, but I pray my anger is over the stuff that breaks God's heart. Oh, Lord, help us. May I suggest that the real source of our anger may be something deeper. Real anger comes from unmet expectations of people, of circumstances, ourselves, of the church, and even God. Think about the time when you got mad at someone. You expected that person to act a certain way, and they didn't, and you just got all uptight about it. Think about a situation you expected to turn out one way, and it didn't. And you got all uptight, and you got uptight with the people involved. You got uptight with God because, hey, God didn't answer it the way you thought. And so now you're all uptight, and, you, and you're just wound up inside. Think about the time when even you're mad at yourself. You said something, you did something that you knew you shouldn't have said it. So you got angry and all uptight with yourself. The interesting thing is, anger happens even in the body of Christ. Could it be that most of us here know the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and there's this understanding that if I know, then probably you know, and we should expect more from each other. And when we don't live up to that standard that we've made for fellow Christians, then when somebody doesn't meet up my expectations, then we get all bent out of shape. The Lord says grace, grace up. No wonder people don't want to know more about Jesus. No wonder people stay away from the church because we don't know how to care for each other. Oh, my brothers and sisters, anger does not have to get the best of us. The Bible and this particular passage in Paul it has an answer to help us overcome. The first thing that I learned from Paul is that anger is a God-given emotion. Paul says in chapter 4, verse 26, in your anger do not sin. Note he says, in your anger. Paul admits here that we will get angry. And that's because we humans are emotional beings. We are compassionate, we're hungry, we, we, we speak out, there's a joy, there's pain. We are emotional beings made in the image of God, even if that image is tarnished. Look through the Bible and we see that even God gets angry. Our great, loving, wonderful God gets ticked off. The Old Testament tells us that the Israelites really had a way of getting God mad. More often than not, they'd have these great, great years of following the Lord, but then they would turn to idols, and they'd try to find other gods, and they'd turn from the Lord. And Moses cried out, and he said that God's chosen people made him jealous with their foreign gods and angered him with their detestable idols. Did you know that at least 50 passages in the Old Testament tell us that God gets angry? And most of the time, it was with his own people. But there's something else we learn about God's anger. God's anger is not reckless, and it is not impulsive. God's anger comes about slowly. At least nine times, I've read a variation of this passage in the scriptures. The Lord is compassionate and gracious slow to anger, abounding in love. God isn't just about to zap you with lightning. No, he cares and he wants us to turn. 
God is really slow to anger. Just consider the decades and the centuries that the Israelites turned from God. They were with them, and then they'd turn their backs and do their own thing, and they'd start getting involved with so many things. They'd bow to idols. They were involved in immorality. They stopped taking care of the poor. They stopped paying attention to the covenant over and over again. They turned their backs on God. And so what does God do? He sends them prophets. If you read through the prophets, we, we get this feeling like the prophets are foretelling what's going to happen. But most of the time, the prophets were calling the people to go back to the covenant. Not just look ahead, but go back to the covenant and obey the God who loves you so much. And because they didn't look back, and because they didn't pay attention, they got into trouble. They were defeated. The temple was destroyed. All of, most of the uh, Jewish people were exiled. Our God is holy, and he will not be mocked or ignored. We can't turn away from God without paying a price. Our sins, our arrogance will catch up with us. You go back to this little passage from Ephesians. We've learned that anger is a God-given emotion, but we also learn that anger is not necessarily evil. Again, Paul says, in your anger, do not sin. So when does anger turn into sin? Anger becomes sin when it's unjustified and when it leads to actions and words that are unchristlike. Anger becomes sin when it's unjustified and it leads us to be unholy. Again, not all anger is sinful. Some anger is justified. Look at Jesus. What a great moment when, when he's going through the temple and remember when he, he rid the, the temple and the outside courts of the money changers? Here they were trying to make extra money by overcharging for the birds and the animals that were used for sacrifice. And Jesus said, this house is a house of prayer. It's my father's house. And so he went in and he took care of it. He was angry. He wasn't in a rage stage, but no, he was angry. He was ticked off. And out of wrath, he, he came forth and got rid of those money changers and all the things that they were doing to turn his father's house of prayer into something money-making and awful. He fashioned a whip, and he went through the courts, overturning tables, sweeping out the merchants, and yelling, my house, my house, my father's house is a house of prayer. We also pick up Christ's anger when he would address the Pharisees. He openly condemns these teachers of the law. And what does he call them? Oh, over and over again, he says, you're not doing this right. He actually called the Pharisees hypocrites, blind guides, whitewashed tombs, snakes, and a brood of vipers. Those are not heart-touchy words. He was ticked. Because here were the people who knew the word and they were using it improperly to put people in bondage rather than freeing them to be God's own. Oh my. We see the similar anger in the letters of Paul. His main enemies were a group of Judaizers. They were the Jewish teachers who went along after Paul would teach and plan a church, and they would say, in order to be a real Christian, you have to be a Jewish Jew first. You have to observe the Torah. You must do these things, observe the feasts, be circumcised, do all of these rituals, and then you can become a Christian. And Paul was really upset with that because not only were they undermining his credibility, but they were also dividing the church, and that's what really got to him. Dividing the church was over the top. Anything that we say or do that would be a source of division in God's loving body is wrong. However we handle this, we've got to pray up and ask the Lord, how must I respond, Lord, that would honor your name and that would continue to build a source of trust and hope in your body? 
Instead of praying about it, oh my, Paul lashes out and he calls the Judaizers, you're dogs, you are mutilators of the flesh, because they believe that only in circumcision could a person be one of God's children. These examples, they show us that there are times when anger is appropriate. When the cause of Christ is damaged, when greed cancels out our care for the poor, when prejudice cancels out love for others. Because of their skin, because of their background, because of their culture, when gossip undermines someone's reputation, when evil triumphs over good, when injustice prevails, we not only can be angry, but we should be angry. Angry enough to live in a way that counters that kind of life. So often, however, we just kind of let it go. We don't want to say anything and stir up any trouble, so we just kind of bite our tongue and let things go along. Which brings to mind an incredible quote the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. May I say good women as well. This incredible quote from Edmund Burke in the 1700s I think is very appropriate for today. We get all uptight about the things that really don't matter and then we're not uptight about the things that really have eternal value. God, oh God, help us to know what to get uptight about. <laughs> and when we get angry, how should we express that anger? This really matters. There is never a place to purposely hurt someone and to resort to violence. There is never a place for that. Paul also says in Ephesians chapter 4 that anger needs boundaries. He says, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Paul says we need to set a time boundary on our anger. You know, sometimes because things have happened to us, we get all uptight and we say, well, you know what? I deserve to be angry. I was wronged. My pastor Lee used to say, I know things happen to us when we get we're, things that are unfair, that are unreal, and we just kind of let them sit but Paul here is giving us a time boundary. He's saying at some point, we need to deal with this. We need to give it to God and let it go. And not just justify our anger and keep talking about it and keep reliving it over and over again. Stop the tapes in the name of Jesus and ask God for help. Now, he says that we should do this before the sun goes down, before the end of a day. And I'm not sure, there are times when we need to cool off and pray. And we need to allow our opponent, be it a spouse or someone in church or a friend, we need to allow them time to cool off and pray. But we need to deal with it. It may not be that night, but it needs to happen sooner than later. Paul then says there's a righteousness boundary to this. He says, don't give the devil a foothold. When there is unresolved anger in our life and we've buried that conflict, something is going on inside of us and it's simmering and it's there, it opens the door for sin. Satan comes along and he whispers to us things like, oh, there she goes again. There they go. Satan comes along and whispers to us, you know, they always treat you like this. You're just nothing. People neglect you. That's just the way they are. That's just the way God is. He's not listening anymore. He didn't hear my prayer. I've been praying. He hasn't answered. And so what do we do? Satan says, give it up. Give up that faith. He's not listening anyway. Have you ever been tempted with those kinds of words? I know where they're coming from. You do too. They're coming from the Lord's adversary. In the name of Jesus, we don't need to listen anymore. We need to take those thoughts captive and give them, make them obedient to Christ. Unresolved anger. 
if there's something deep down inside of you and it's still simmering, it can give Satan a foothold and in time it becomes a stronghold and it can de destroy our faith. So how do we deal with our anger? How do we deal with those things that just at times irritate us and they still, they're simmering within our hearts? We see it, we feel it, we hear it, and, and it just sets us off. What do we do with this? Well, I hate to say it, but a lot of people just deny it. They deal with anger by just denying it. Many Christians were notorious for, for pretending that we're not angry. We go about smiling, and if somebody says, how are you doing? Fine, I'm fine, fine, because I don't want to be a burden, so I don't say anything. We don't even use the word anger. Instead, we say, well, I'm a little upset. I'm a little irritated. We need to realize that denying anger doesn't make it go away. Some people bottle up their anger. They suppress it. We acknowledge that we're annoyed a bit, but we don't do anything about it. So we pack it in all the more tighter in our life. And even if we want to do something about it, we don't know what to do. So we just kind of go on, and it's there, and it's still simmering, but we don't know what to do. I've shared this probably with you before, but when I first married Ed, I became the instant mom to two teenage sons. And they were so gracious to me. I was a stepmom, and I, I didn't quite know how to do this, but they invited me into their lives, and I will never, I can't thank God enough for Kurt and Kevin and, and their inviting me into their lives. But you know what it's like when you're a parent. Sometimes kids say and do th things that are kind of dumb. And as a stepmom, I didn't know quite what to do. And so I kept observing and I didn't do anything. I just kind of suppressed and suppressed. And, and sometimes they were doing things that really got on my nerves, but I didn't know what to do. And so I just kind of kept silent about it. And it kept building up to the point where I got sick. I got actually sick. I was observing things. And you know, if you're a mom or dad, if you see your, your kids go, making decisions that can harm them, it breaks your heart. I was getting sick and sicker by the day. And one day it got to the point where I had to call. I called on some friends to come and pray over me because I needed to know, what do I do, Lord? What is my place as a stepmom? I don't know exactly what I'm to do. And so I prayed, and this person came over and prayed over me. And in this time of prayer, I began to sob. I literally began to cry and cry. The stuff was coming out of me. It was almost like a spirit of anger was coming out of me. And do you know that all the symptoms that were very much like lupus, that were really dangerous in my life, they began to disappear. There was a tie between the emotional and the physical. And when I called on God to really lift it out of my body and people prayed over me, my poor mom was downstairs and she heard something going on and I'm sobbing upstairs. She thought it was an exorcism. <laughs> what are they doing to my daughter up there? And maybe in some ways it could be. I needed a spirit of anger to be taken from my spirit. And there are some of you here that have been carrying things for your whole life and it's still simmering inside and God says to you, child, let go. Now, I'm going to share a few things with you to let these things go, but you know what? You can read those in your bulletin. I just want to stop right here. If there are things in your life that have been ridding you, that have been undermining your peace and your joy in Christ. Let it go. Come to the Lord and ask God for, for the grace to deal with this properly. To lift that simmering irritation in your, in your spirit and to be free. We all need grace. I don't know how long you've known him. It really doesn't matter. We all need 
God's amazing grace every single day to respond to this world and the problems of our life and to respond to the people who know how to press our buttons, we need Jesus. Maybe now more than ever, because we seem to be on edge. Would you stand with me this morning? I'd let to ask Phil to come. And there was a song that just spoke to my heart, and, and I thought this would be good. And, and I just want to open the altar again to anyone that you, that you just need the grace of God to really deal with something inside. You know what it is because when things irritate you, you tend to overreact. It can be a small annoyance, but you just explode. And that's not the way to live, especially if you're a child of God. Is there another way to do this? I believe Jesus has the answer. And I, I, as we sing this, if anybody just wants to come and, and just bow at the altar and just say, Lord, I, I really need your help with this particular situation. I need you to touch my body. I need you to touch my spirit and free me from getting so uptight. I want to be that man or woman you're calling me to be. I can't hold on to this any longer. I'm tired. Would you forgive me? Would you come into my heart and let me understand what it means to be angry over the things that break your heart, but at the same time have a resolve and a peace in my life? So as we sing, if you're led of the Holy Spirit to just come and bow before God as we, before we go today, let's just lift these words to the Lord. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. Lord, that's our prayer this morning. Would you have your way in us? If there's been something, Lord God, that's been robbing us of joy in you, if there's something from my past, even something that somebody said years ago, if there's something unfair that's happened in my life and it is just gnawing at my spirit, Lord God, keeping me from pure love for you and for your body, whatever it is, Lord God, if there is anger in my spirit, Help me release it and give it to you. And then, Lord God, if there's anything I need to say to someone, give me the grace, Lord God, to go to that offender and at least be honest to speak the truth in love. That's what this is about. It's not just letting it out, but it's sharing it with deep love and care for that other person. It's no guarantee that we'll be reconciled or best friends, but Lord God, I want to live my life so completely for you that if this would bless you, Lord, if this would glorify you and lift your name on high, Lord God, then I want to take that first step, whatever it takes to be a person of reconciliation. Show me. Help me to let go. Help me to be a person of your peace of your love that goes beyond whatever's happened to me. This is no longer about me. It's all about you. It always has been. It's not just about our church. It's about you. It's not what I want. It's all about you. It's all about you and what you long us to be. So I surrender today, God, whether I'm here at the altar, standing or sitting, wherever I am at this very moment, I surrender to you. And if I can't do it right now, give me the grace to not live with this simmering anger anymore, but to let it go and let you have it. 
And then, Lord God, created me the desire, the love, the care to put you and others before myself. Grow me up, God. Grow us all up to be your true children. We need you now more than ever. In the powerful name that puts anger in its place. Jesus, the Son of God. Amen. Have a blessed day in the Lord. Pray. Continue to seek God's face. Take care.